Hi, welcome to another episode of this weekly preview of The Week in Digital, a newsletter I put out on scottmonte.com. If you have a chance, go over and check it out. Uh, we've got a link right up there at the top to subscribe. It's a uh, weekly uh, digital wrap-up that comes to you uh, in your inbox every Monday morning, covering the topics of digital marketing and social media, uh, the collaborative economy, privacy, legal issues, um, and things you need to think about. And what I like to do every Sunday afternoon or evening uh, is to get into two or three issues a little more in depth and talk about what's driving some of uh, the opinion and whatnot. And you have to excuse me this week, I'm not at my uh, usual location at home because uh, I am here at the Detroit airport uh, getting ready to leave for San Francisco for about 24 hours. So uh, doing this on the go, uh, mobile. It's live right now. If you uh, get a chance, go back and watch it from the beginning uh, before. So I want to get right into uh, this. And, and I do have uh, the weekly trivia question here. So uh, if you want to get on board with that, feel free to uh, take a guess. Uh, this week's trivia question is, out of all of the digital marketing uh, tactics, which one have researchers found to be the most effective? Which digital marketing tactic have researchers found to be the most effective? We'll cover that at the end of the show. And it's also going to be in the newsletter, so no spoilers for those of you who are seeing this now uh, ahead of everyone who's going to get that newsletter tomorrow. So you probably heard over the last week or so uh, with the, the big Apple announcement that iOS 9 is going to natively contain ad blocking capabilities. And I think that's something that is worth uh, a lot of discussion. Um, you know, folks have, um, especially folks from the advertising side, have been very concerned about ad blocking. Um, that if you basically give people the capability, and you already do have it on uh, Firefox and Chrome through some extensions, um, now this puts it in the hands of Apple users uh, in Safari. If you do that, then you're basically going to be taking away a lot of the income, a lot of the revenue stream that makes a lot of web content uh, free. And if you do that, then it's going to put publishers at a disadvantage. Um, you know, I like to, to take a little bit of a different uh, approach on this. And, and before I do give you my opinion, and, and it's only worth my opinion, it's one guy's opinion, so uh, feel free to disagree. Sorry, gin and tonic. Um, I want to let you know that um, there was one major ad blocking uh, technology this week launched by, uh, I believe it was launched by uh, Michael Arment. Um, he, he, uh, it was called Peace, and he decided to yank it about 24 hours after uh, it went live. He, he yanked his ad blocking technology, and it was one of the most popular um, apps in the Apple, uh, in the Apple Store. Uh, in, in the App Store uh, for the first 24 hours. So you can see that people are calling for this kind of stuff. Um, so there's been a little bit of reversal there, and a little bit of uh, soul searching, but it, I'm sure it's because he doesn't want to cause a lot of harm to the ad industry. But I think that the ad industry needs to understand that the stuff that they're doing is so annoying that people don't want to see it. You know, they've had, as Seth Godin pointed out, They've had 15 years to get their act in order to improve digital marketing tactics. And yet, here we are in 2015, and, and people are falling all over themselves to block ads. So I guess the question is, can we get better at creating ads and creating marketing that's more of a story rather than an interruption, rather than you know, a digital billboard? You know, I, I talk about this an awful lot in the speeches I give, that we've taken the technology that was already broken uh, throughout most of the 20th century, the interruptive kind of technology, television ads, the 30-second spots, uh, billboards, um, and, and we basically approximated all of that old-fashioned advertising for, uh, and, and we, we brought it over to the digital space. All right? So you've taken something that's broken once and you put it in a new platform, and, and on social, even worse. Right? So it's broken two times over, and we're wondering why people are falling all over themselves to block those ads it's not really that much of a uh, uh, not, not that much of a stretch of the imagination so I think that you know it's incumbent once again upon marketers to get better at being storytellers at interesting people in what's going on not by focusing on themselves all the time but finding common ground 
And I think we're going to see a lot more dependence on native advertising, you know, for uh, ads that are built into editorial, that are built into, um, you know, more of a journalistic setting uh, as we move forward. So um, that's, that's one of the things that was on my mind uh, this week. Another thing is that you probably saw that Facebook uh, turned on or, or will be turning on a, uh, a dislike feature. Now, they're not necessarily calling it dislike, and it seemed from the discussion from the town hall where Mark Zuckerberg brought it up that uh, it was going to be more of a, almost like an empathy button. You know, if you share the news that a loved one died, for example, a lot of times you'll see people saying, well, I, I want to offer my condolences, but I don't feel like clicking the like button really uh, g gives that, that total feeling. You don't want to like that somebody passed away. So the, the, this notion of a dislike button may be something more along the lines of uh, an, an empathetic button. Um, but related to that, um, Facebook announced that uh, they are actually going to do like tracking. Right? So if you like content across Facebook, it's basically going to act like an advertising cookie. It's going to attach itself to your profile, and then based on where you go across the web, Facebook is going to know about that based on you having had an affinity for something um, well, with them on, um, on, on the Facebook platform. So when you go to other sites, they're going to be able to track that. And then when you come back to Facebook, they're going to be able to get more uh, accurate in terms of the advertising that they serve to you. So a little bit of a dislike, a little bit of a uh, news on uh, like, um, you know, some interesting things going on at Facebook. If you're just joining, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a video preview of The Week in Digital. It's a weekly newsletter that I put out. It comes to your inbox for free every Monday morning. If you want to head over to scottmonte.com and subscribe, I uh, would certainly appreciate that. And also, if you have a chance, head to convinceandconvert.com. I'm working with Jay Baer, who is the CEO of Convince and Convert, uh, on a weekly feature called The Monte Minute, where I write up something similar to uh, you know what we've got going on here in video uh, and Jay shares it out with his significant platform so you can sign up uh, over there on uh, convinceandconvert.com uh, Hi Rochelle, uh, yes this is live so thanks for tuning in uh, it will be saved later uh, I see Steve Garfield just joined, Richard Olkin is on board, hi guys my friends from Boston, good to see you um, I am broadcasting from uh, the Detroit airport this week as I'm on my way out to San Francisco. Busy week ahead. I'm going to be in uh, uh, D.C. on the East Coast and then down in Tampa for the Social Fresh Conference on Thursday and Friday. So looking forward to running into folks there. The last thing I wanted to talk about, um, and again, this, you'll see some links in uh, this week's newsletter about this, but I want to talk about it a little more in depth, and that is uh, some of the competition that Uber has been seeing lately, um, particularly inter internationally. You know, Uber's style, when they move into a new market, whether it's a city like Portland uh, or uh, Las Vegas, uh, for example, um, is they will go in and they will... Uh, ask for forgiveness rather than permission because in a lot of cities you'll see uh, regulations and uh, laws that keep Uber from doing what they're doing at the expense of taxi drivers uh, and, and Las Vegas actually, Nevada specifically, just uh, passed a law that uh, or regulation that uh, makes Uber legal in the state of Nevada so don't expect long lines at the taxi queue at McCarran anymore. However, that kind of approach hasn't really worked in certain markets, in, in certain foreign markets. In France, for example, uh, where the home competitor is Blah Blah Car, and yeah, that's a real name. They, and by the way, Blah Blah Car just raised $200 million, uh, one of the largest rounds of venture capital that France has ever seen. Um, when, when a foreign competitor like Uber goes in there and, and let's face it, takes an American approach, um, unfortunately, um, what that does is it creates a lot of strife and a lot of um, uh, just a lot of friction in the local market and uh, they'll want to try and you know uh, either prosecute them in which case they're doing with Uber uh, you actually saw a couple of Uber executives arrested in France and they're going to be prosecuted for <laughs> violating the law but interestingly in China where it's also very difficult to do business Tencent which uh, owns a lot of the um, a lot of the apps like WeChat, for example, where they have hundreds of millions of people on there. Um, Tencent blocked Uber 
from accessing its WeChat app. And Tencent also owns uh, Didi Kwai, and Didi Kwai is is partnering with Lyft, which is a U.S. competitor of uh, Uber, and each of them is making uh, the app or, or drivers available in the other's country. Right. So if you're a Lyft passenger and you go to China, you'll be able to access the Didi Kwai uh, drivers and vice versa. And basically, they've created an international. Uh, a, a global ride-hailing app going around Uber, right? So I think you know Uber, as it's looking at at its strategy, yeah, they're going to keep pushing ahead, but at the same time, they need to look for these weaknesses and these threats from the outside that they not, can't necessarily control. You know? And when you take that very brash culture and bring it into a foreign country, it isn't necessarily going to uh, to map all the time. Right. So those are the topics I wanted to cover this week. Um, I did want to uh, get back to that trivia question that I promised. Um, I asked you, of all of the digital marketing tactics, which do researchers find is the most efficient? And the answer, if you haven't guessed it by now, is email. That's right. Good old-fashioned email still manages to uh, to be effective uh, and cost-effective too. I mean, it doesn't really cost a lot to put a good email program together. You can still reach people. Uh, you're getting the open rates. You're getting the conversions. You're getting people that want to take action on things that you're sharing. So think about email the next time you think about your marketing plans. Speaking of email, I hope you will subscribe to the Week in Digital newsletter via email. Just head over to scottmonte.com and check it out. I hope I'll get a chance to interact with you uh, throughout the week on Facebook or Twitter or wherever you may be. And I thank you very much for tuning in. Take care.